with Gail King here with Making a Difference with Gail. I'm with Bob Carfesto at Angela's house and can't wait to go in and find out more about this. Today I'm really on it because I have with me Bob Policastro from Angela's house one, two, and three. I'm going to ask you if you would mind sharing a little bit of background as to how we got to this incredible place, Angela's house. Well, it, it now is 24 years where my wife and I were happily looking to have our second child. And uh, basically a crisis at birth uh, left her very frail. And uh, what we realized from that point was that being able to care for her at home became a dead end. There was no support systems for us to do that. And then we realized how kids were living in hospitals. Not only, you know, in the hospital where my daughter was throughout, throughout the, the whole region. And then I learned that it was happening throughout the United States. And I said, you know, it's bad enough as a parent that you go through this, but when you didn't have the support systems, it just made a bad situation worse. So I immediately tried to look into how I might be able to get my daughter home or have a facility set up so she could be cared for in a facility. Uh, she only lived a year, so I didn't stop at that point. I continued knowing, especially after a year of meeting so many different parents and, and it being kind of a very silent population out there that I needed to continue. And uh, it took 10 years to get our first home. And even before that, we started with our home care services, and that has been really fantastic too because now, you know, this last year, we hit a new milestone of helping 600 kids throughout the region, uh, majority on, on Long Island, and we also help some kids in the city too. So it really has been a, you know, a miraculous road in a sense, you know, it, it's such a, a great sense to, to know what parents are going through but now being able to impact that in, in a way that's so positive compared to, you know, I, I feel like well, my wife and I, we just, every angle we looked at was kind of a dead end for us. So out of necessity, all of this came about? It's a population that a lot of people don't understand. Um, there's no one word to capture the kids that we refer to as sometimes medically frail, right. chronically ill, it's really been our goal to identify families and then really try to do everything we can to assist that parent to take that child home mm -hmm. and for those kids that are stuck in the hospital or can no longer leave at home that we can have an alternative um, such as the homes that we're building that can be a home away from home for them. What our effort then becomes is how do we get those support systems and that's that's where we have put a lot of our effort into. So we have coordinators, social workers, and nurses that, that work with the families on a regular basis and contact with them on a regular basis. And what that does is we try to then take them every step along the way. You know, we try to identify some important programs that could be the backbone to make it possible to let them go home. Even things that people would never dream that are out there, such as some of the exceptions within Medicaid. For a middle class family, which never would think that that's possible, but for the child you can help them. So it's it's been our way to kind of be, you know, a, a, a full resource to help them really complete their dream of having well, the kids well, with them. What if someone isn't involved with Medicare or has financial difficulty, and we know how expensive surgeries and medical treatment can be, what are some of the things that you would be able to help out with? Well. One of the, the programs that we do, we've gotten grants to try to, to help parents get some temporary help. Um, we, we, we understand that insurance companies at times can be dead ends, but maybe we can help them you know, get the reimbursement that they need. Uh, we, I mentioned uh, the Medicaid program, which are, is referred to a waiver program. Um, in our case, it has a name called Care at Home, and that becomes important because that Whereas a middle class family may never think that they would ever qualify for a, some type of social assistance, but technically speaking they don't, but the child can. And, and this is because the federal government realized the cost of having that child live in the hospital is insanely expensive. So if you can have them home, it's, it's the best environment for the child and it's 
you know, making it affordable. So that's when you can then maybe bring in nursing. That's when it could be a supplement to your private insurance. And then what we try to do is we fundraise and seek other grants and other companies and corporations to support us because, you know, if insurance says no, or if Medicaid says no, or state grants mm -hmm. aren't available, we want them to have that backup, backup. Okay. to be able to. And we've, the foundation that we've created spends over $200,000 in, in assisting parents with all their resources that to help them have their, their kids comfortably at home. Well, I know that you are getting some help, and I remember reading that, I think it was Assemblyman Harvey Weisenberg, Weisenberg yes. and you also had, uh, I think it was the uh, G, IGHL. So tell us a little bit well, about that. That was in 1990s, first, correct? First of all, when you look at um, Harvey Wiesenberg, mm -hmm. uh, our difficulty in the beginning was the fact that the state wasn't even looking at this population. Mm -hmm. There was very little plans. The federal government was beginning to come up with some of these exceptions to the rule with Medicaid, which had just started. Just a, an absolute wonderful, good-hearted person. Um, him and his wife have a development of a disabled son, so he, he really, he totally understands. He has a heart of gold, along with his wife, and they they backed us and said, you know, we would, we would love to be that last push with government that to help them understand that our kids are being sent out of state or far away, and he, he assisted us. At that same time, when, when looking at trying to create something, totally brand new, never done before, um, I was very fortunate to meet some wonderful agencies across Long Island and New York State, and one of those was IGHL. It's, it's a short for Independent Group Home Living, who has been a, a wonderful backing to us. Uh, in the early years when, when this was all just a theory, and this was something that, you, you know, I was kind of just talking to myself Calling about it. I wasn't even, not, yes. Not expecting it to happen. They were very willing and, and open to say, you know what, here's, here's the budgets, here's what it costs to run a home. Uh, and then what I did was I said, all right, medically, what's needed? And then I started to almost write a thesis of what, how this could be done and the cost comparison between doing this versus home care and, and, and a hospitalization. And it was easily proven, the cost savings to do something like this. And uh, without that support in the beginning, we could have never, never moved on. To this point. So when we, when we when we end up getting the approval and the uh, the money to uh, run the first house, it was it was a natural then to go back to YGHL and say, can we do this and, and team together to make this possible? And you can't you can't do everything, you know. I'm not a believer like you have to reinvent the wheel. They are uh, absolutely amazing agency that knows they knew how to do what the old homes and here we were saying let's let's try to help the kids now but you know there are so many people in today's time that don't have the funds that would still like to contribute and we had Brielle's fashion show which took place uh, in September of this year over at Ohika Castle we had I, I came in with Felicia Stern and other beauty pageant winners to reach our children. What are some of the things that the community could help with that perhaps they don't have the funds, but they still want to show that as a community, we really do care? I, I tell you, you know, I've, I've learned just even in awareness. I've, I've gone and visited some middle schools and some schools across Long Island. And, and the kids, you know, they're, they're so attentive to want to understand that this is happening around them. and they're willing to do almost anything. You know, it, it could be cake drives or cupcake drives or, you know, even selling something that they make and at, at, the, at the school. And you know, they're so proud, even just to get $50 or $100. It, and to me, I think that's a win-win situation because it's, it's not just about how much you raise. It, it's really teaching the kids a great and valuable lesson in, in their lives. This, you know, this is something, these are their neighbors. And you know, we've seen Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts that have come to the house and done their projects, which make the property that much more beautiful, memorials that, you know, it, it's, it's very uplifting. We've, we've also had some of the groups come in and, and help plant around the house. 
So the activities of the kids are, are amazing. And, and sometimes it doesn't even, it's not even a group. I mean, how proud when you hear, you know, uh, a young boy sitting there doing a lemonade stand, right. you know, making a few dollars and being as proud as can be. To me, that is, that is so precious. And look what you're giving them. We all know the value and the beauty of giving to others. So in turn, they're getting this fabulous gift as well. But suppose our viewers, our listeners, would like to contribute. Where do they send the money? And we know, of course, this is a you know, 501c3 program. So where could they send this? Our P.O. Box, or our main mm -hmm. address, would be then Angela's house, P.O. Box 5052 in Hopog. And the zip is 11788. Uh, or they can go right on to our website, which is angelashouse.org. And they can learn more about us or donate right at all on our website. And you'll also see some of the events that, that we have throughout throughout the year. And it's, uh, you know, I think we have a... Uh, you do. I think I heard about the holiday December project and yeah, helping we, hands. It, and I think it's good for people to see mm -hmm. some of that. I mean, the, the volunteers that came out with this past year, we did a two-day holiday party for the parents, kids, and siblings. And, and I stress the parents, the kids, and the siblings because this is about the family. Yes. And it was a total escape for them. It was as if we put them on a plane and flew them down to Disney for the day. We just, we just try to spoil them. We, it's a, we put on shows. Uh, we are very blessed to have uh, a sponsor, um, Arthur Krantz. He, right, uh, right. He, he's he's been we call him King Arthur. He's just amazing. He, I bet uh, he's a big kid when he comes oh, here too, he, right? <laughs> he, he loves every he minute is. of it. Right. You know, he orchestrates and, and, and sets things up, which is just fabulous. This year for the summer, we we had another uh, company step forward to help us with a summer event, White Post Farms. Oh, of course. And mm -hmm. and there it it is totally wheelchair accessible. So here, kids are going to be able to see the animals and, and have almost like a summer picnic environment. So I love that because I think it's it's important to, you know, always put your arms around the parents and the kids and Excellent. say, you know what, we're there supporting you. Excellent. The other thing too is the statue, the Angel of Hope. Could you share? Because I think you and I were talking earlier about this whole concept of hope. And you know. When we had the first house built, I was blessed to learn about this angel, and uh, it it was came out of a book called The Christmas Box, and the author was from Utah, and it was a story about a family going to uh, this mountain, would go to this uh, cemetery and go to this angel. The author was almost forced to have a statue built in Utah. Then he started seeing that people were showing up even at his book signings, talking about the loss of a child, and it, it almost went beyond what he could have ever imagined. Then it started where people said, can we replicate them? And once I learned that, I said, can we bring one to Long Island? And we do a candlelight vigil the first Saturday of uh, every year. Uh, we get crowds of close to 300 people plus, and uh, it's just a very, we don't view it as a, sad it's a, it, it's my family takes it almost as a celebration, a celebration of, of our daughter where do you see yourself in angela's house 10 years from now continue to grow and maybe even expand you know even more so into the city and other parts of the state and maybe even beyond that because i think people have to learn what this population is you know it, it's still it really is it's kind of in its infancy stages still you know, even after 20 years doing this, I think it's hard for people to comprehend, you know, that there are kids with long-term debilitating situations that are living right around the corner from you, and, and they can use all the help they can. I have been smiling through this whole interview. I want to thank you so much. Thank you.